Good afternoon, buenos dias to everyone. So today uh, we continue with our second module on the theme of parenting. So let us welcome Jean-Jean Sazonga Nunga. He's going to talk to us about the practical experience of strengthening parenting skills in uh, the case of partial or total family breakups. Jean-Jacques Suzango is uh, uh, a graduate from the University of Kinzanzani. He's a psychopedagogist since 2006, and he's in charge of the programs on social integration. And he's also in charge of PEDER, and he's also the resource person of PEDER on resilience. So we would like to leave the floor to Jean-Jean, and we would like to thank him for his presence and also for the experiences that he will share with us. Thank you, Jean-Jean, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank Bisset for giving me this opportunity to share our experience on the practical experience of strengthening parenting skills in the case of partial or total family breakups. Let me first of all uh, explain what it, these partial or total breakups are. We talk about partial breakup when a child in the morning, uh, he leaves his home and he spends the whole day in the street. He doesn't go to school. He starts to work, to do whatever. And then when it's 8 or 9 p.m., he goes back to the family. This is what we call partial breakup. A total breakup is when a child totally leaves his family. So he takes the street as his new home and he lives in the street normally so this is a total breakup now after this i think that we can begin my presentation um well uh, merlor already introduced me so i do not think that uh, any further introduction is needed well i do not know whether you want to add anything now uh, my presentation doesn't go on my slides do not go on they do not move now, my presentation uh, deals with focusing on three basic points. First of all, we're going to talk about the general terms, and I'm going to, first of all, introduce what PEDER is, then we will um, move on to the definition of keywords. But before doing that, I'm going to describe a typically family portrait, the family we work with, then we're going to define keywords. Then I'm going to focus on the problems experienced by parents in their upbringing of their children. So these are the problems that we daily see at PEDER. Then I'm going to also share with you some of the causes of the difficulties uh, encountered by the parents in the bringing of their children. And then we are going to share some techniques that use at PEDER, and then we're going to move on to the second part. Now, this is our experience at PEDER. So this is what we're, I'm going to, pre uh, to present. And the third part uh, concerns the family mediation process. What is this process? What do we do for these children who are experiencing a total or partial breakup for their families? So this is uh, uh, what I intend to do this afternoon with you. So here, our oh, short presentation of PEDER. PEDER is uh, an acronym that uh, means a program to support children living in the streets. And it was established in 1989 in the city of Bukavu, a province of Sud Kivu in the Democratic Republic of Congo. It is a social and charitable work of the St. Gemma Sisters Congregation, and it is a, a juridical personality of this congregation. Now, we work with children who uh, experience a partial or a total breakup. So children who are socially excluded, children who find it hard to adapt to their family milieu. And what we do, I mean, our work starts in the streets, 
And in this trade, we start to raise awareness among the children, we get in touch with them, we tell them, we uh, explain to them, we give them alternatives to earn a living. And they can also join our centers, enter our centers. And then when the children are in a partial breakup and they come to our centers, well, they in the end go back to their families. If they're in a total breakup, then where they go to a specific center to a specific residential center. Well, there is a psychosocial accompaniment of these children. And in doing so, we also provide formation and training. Those who have not are not schooled, they uh, learn to write and read. And those who forgot to read and write, they relearn that, but they also learn a job and for those uh, who are young, well, we give, give them school counseling. And we also provide support to their families. We work with families so that they can integrate their children totally. So this is, in short, what we do with children. Uh, I don't want to be too long in my presentation because most of it the largest part, the part I want to focus on is the second part. Now, the key words we have, parenting. Parenting is the link between a child and an adult, whatever the family structure in which uh, this bond happens. And this uh, is done in order to provide care, the development and the education and the well-being of the child. So we do not only see parents, because when we talk about parenting skills, so we're not simply talking about the parents, the biological parents, but we are talking about all those who accepted to welcome a child and help him or her develop. This is what we call parenting. So and then we have a positive parenting, which aims to equip parents with tools to create a state of mind that propose, that promotes the development of children and the well-being of parents. So ultimately, positive parenting is about working on oneself to acquire new parenting skills in order to establish a new positive relationship with one's child and to support him or her in his or her development. Often, many people believe that being a parent is something that comes from within. But with time, we understood, over time, we understood that as you develop, as you grow in your parenting, you have to develop a, a sense of positivity. You have to be positive with your children. You do not have to work always the same way, but you have to make sure that your child fully develops. And responsible parenting is the action of any person, of any parent, who respects his or her educational commitments towards his or her children. Some children are, sorry, some parents are parents, but they neglect their children, they do not spend time with them, they do nothing for them. They do not care about their children, so they are not in charge, they're not responsible for their children, and they are therefore, they are therefore not responsible parents. Now, a few problems. Now, before moving on to the problems, I would like to get to the core of the issue. I would like to present a family um, portrait, a typical family with which we work. A mother, uh, she manages to get some food, she goes home after work, she's very tired and she starts to prepare food at the meal. The children go to her, they want to talk to her, they want to play with her, but she's very busy. She's very tired after work, so she neglects her children. The dad comes back home, he's brutal. The older children flee home, and some even risk to spend the night outside. The smaller children, the youngest children, they lock themselves up in their rooms. So the parents, they, oh, and the father starts to insult her wife. 
they start to fight and the whole family uh, finds itself in this chaotic situation. So this happens in many, many families that we accompany. So we ask ourselves some questions. What sort of education, what sort of upbringing will those children have from their parents, parents who don't speak to one another, parents who do not have the time to care for their children, parents who are always in a conflict? What is the image that these children have of their own parents? What is the image that these what is the image that these children have of their own parents? Because they, these parents are like the devil, they are like enemies. So children, these children risk fleeing their families for and, and to look for another parents in the street. So this, what is also the idea that these parents have of parenting. Now, me, as a parent, I have to care for my children. Even after a long day's work, I have to care for my children. I have to try and speak to my children, give them advice and give them an alternative other ways uh, and, and give them advice for their lives. And, so you see, these are major problems for these parents. Uh, children skip school and some use their money uh, that they should use for their uh, school to uh, go to the movies, to buy silly things. For instance, they have money to, I don't know, pay the school or to buy something for the school. Is that the children use that money to buy silly things, uh, gadgets. And then the children want to have more freedom. That is why they escape from their family home and go to the street. And then uh, you see when the parents come home, often uh, the older children leave the house. They often spend the night in another house. So the children, they flee from their family home. And that is a major problem because um, these children uh, will not be uh, monitored and not followed by their children, by the parents. The children also uh, consume psychoactive products like cannabis and others. These are often uh, prohibited by the law. And these are even often prohibited by their own families. And the children, the girls, uh, have early sexual intercourses. They remain pregnant uh, as minors. And this means that they will spend a whole year without going to school. They are going, and then they will no longer have the time to study because they will need to care for their own children. The boys often uh, start to steal others associated with criminals, which means that they end up in the uh, criminal justice system. And these children, when they are in the street, they want to have money, they look for money. So they start to steal, then they associate to criminal groups and the justice system catches them and then they will be arrested sooner or later. And these children are so stubborn that they do not follow the uh, advice given by their parents. There is also generational conflict that, that we see very, very often. The parent, the, the children say that their parents are uh, um, they, they are not modern and also the advice given by the parents, well, the children, these children, they don't want to hear that. Often parents go looking for money, go looking for, for food. And therefore, that is why they're absent for long periods. At times, it's both parents that are away for a long time. One of the parents go, for instance, 50 kilometers from the village and they are going to, they will spend a month or even two months alone uh, outside of the house so the children have no one to turn to and they do not have anyone to turn to for advice they do not have an educational point of reference in their life for long periods and their upbringing will be stopped some causes and some difficulties met by 
um, parents in the bringing of their children. Now, the turbulence of children, especially in the um, in teenage, they are very stubborn. They always want to live outside their families instead of being part of their families. The influence of their peers, their friends, and the adoption of certain behaviors prohibited by the family. In the family, there are no smokers, but as the, 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 the children's peers are smokers, then these children start smoking. And this triggers conflicts within the family. It's also uh, an inner conflict that the child experiences because the family rules. It grows, sorry. And then there is also parents who are very strict uh, parents uh, want to have the highest authority in the family. These are social stereotypes that the parents adopt, uh, and children do not want to stand this uh, type of authority. And then the separation of parents has an impact on the relationship between children and parents who have uh, uh, agreed to take charge of the child. Very often, parents blame the children for the, ports, for the faults committed by his or her partner. If the child, for instance, lives with his mother and the child does something wrong, the mother will say, oh, you behave like, like, like your father. And this is terrible for the child. If the child lives with the father, the same will happen. The father will say, oh, you took after your mother. And with these words, the child will uh, never be will never agree with his stepmother or stepfather. And then the alcoholism of the parents or of one of the parents greatly hinders the parents' responsibility in the educational process of the children. So uh, parents will do terrible things because of alcoholism and this somehow hinders the parenting idea the image that the child had of his father or mother will uh, actually be destroyed and then the lack of consideration for children living in foster families here uh, we have many children whom we accompany who are in foster families some families are so poor, that they have to entrust their children to an uncle, to an aunt, to someone, and the child will never be considered as the other children in the family. He will eat in the kitchen while the others will eat in the dining room. And also when the family buys uh, clothes or shoes for their children, or well, these foster children will have second-hand clothing and shoes. And then the precariousness of families results in children being considered as production factors, not as children who are entitled to love, to affection and attention. Many children are marginalized. Many are sent by their parents to you know, go looking for food or money. And when they go back home in the evening, they have to bring back their share because otherwise they will be beaten. There will be, the child will be punished. And that is because of this precariousness. Now here in Africa, boys are favored over girls in families. And for instance, boys go to school while girls do not go to school. Um, boys are dressed smartly, they are respected, whereas girls uh, uh, are less privileged. And they will be told uh, when you have your own family, your husband will look after you. And so she's not going to study. The girls uh, uh, do not study. So what are the techniques that we use uh, in our program to reduce these brutal educational practices, uh, to create positive interactions between children and parents, to strengthen 
effective bonds between parents and the people who are care for the child. Now, in encouraging families to adopt positive educational practices, we can do prevention, separation of, um, we can avoid the risk that children be uh, mistreated in the families, the risk that children are victims of violence. And also, we avoid the risk of violent behavior between among the children within uh, one family. At PEDER, we use, uh, first of all, parents' meetings. During these meetings, we organize what, uh, one meeting per month. So every month, there is a parent meeting. At the beginning, well, there is a general theme that we uh, address with all the parents, for instance, uh, uh, parenting the role of parents or teenage or other themes. After this theme, after say, talking about this general theme, the parents are called, are invited to uh, form small groups, uh, small groups that address the specific problems that they have with their own children, for instance, uh, children fleeing from their homes, uh, children or parents who do not listen to their uh, uh, children, parents who do not listen to their children, and so on. And we try and find solutions so that we can improve the family relationship. So parents go back to their families go back home with a different idea, with more ideas as to how to deal with this problem. The second means that we use, the second technique, uh, is represented by resilient, resilient workshops with parents. We have these workshops also with children, but we organize more specifically some of the resilient workshops with parents, which are organized once a month. But we address some specific themes uh, that we address with both parents and children after um, addressing the theme. Well, I have to say that these workshops favor bonds and communication between parents and children, and children understand little by little the idea, what is the idea, what is the goal of the family, what is the sense uh, that they want to achieve. And we were really struck and surprised by something because some parents, after taking part in one of the resilience workshops in our center, they go back to the family and they repeat the same, what they learned with their children to their children. Uh, for instance, um, a parent told us uh, this. He uh, basically um, drew a sort of code of arm of the family ideal, and he showed that to his children. That was really good because uh, he showed his children what ideal he wanted to achieve in his, the educating his children. So they, uh, so the parent was very happy to see that the children understood his vision of education, of, uh, you know, of upbringing. We also have a positive parenting workshops. These workshops have, are organized once a, for three months. So even in January, we had a resilience workshop. In February, we have a positive parenting workshop. In the next month, we will have another resilience workshop. And then on the next month, a positive parenting workshop. And well, we do not invite all the parents in these positive parenting workshops, but we we'll invite some parents who have relational problems with their children. In the second part of my presentation, I'm going to present, I'm going to show you what the various stages of these uh, workshops are. The first technique um, is individual interviews. Uh, when we, a child comes to us saying, I have this problem with my mother or parents, so well, we invite the parents to the center. And then 
or rather we go and visit the family is the parents do not accept to come to the center then we go and visit the families and these individual interviews uh, in these individual interviews we address uh, the specific problem of the child that the parents speak and they find a new way to gather for a good upbringing of the child we also have uh, family visits well these family visits are fundamental for the children who are in partial and total or total breakup from their families this family visits give us a lot of information on a child's situation because a child can leave the family can flee his family his or her family but he doesn't have the courage to speak to his family so when we get to the family well i mean we are there to support the parents and we encourage parents to get in touch with the children and the children when they see that we are already in touch with the families they start to ask for more and more information from us and then we can bring back the children to their families and then we engage in family mediation thanks to that the child that the children will little by little integrate back into his or her family the sixth technique is family mediation family mediation aims at reintegrating uh, the children back in their families we work also through indirect mediations before starting these mediations first of all we have to have the authorization of the families because the children and the parents have to tell us that they want to engage this uh, in the mediation and also we have to have a clear idea of what the problem is um, when we started the mediation we started to talk so the operator listened to the children and after that he or she listens to the parents and then we put them together and they can start to talk to one another because there are some children that have huge conflicts with their parents and they cannot really express themselves before their parents so this reunification uh, with this sharing initiative is fundamental some children are not accepted by their communities and that is why we must try and reach a consensus a mediation with the community so that the children can go back to their families so mediation is not simply with the child with the children but also with the parents with the whole families with the whole community and with all the community leaders we also have a working group with the parents this is the seventh technique we try and have a parents to have common problems for instance children who flee from home so these parents we well, basically join forces and together these parents start to reflect they choose the themes they want to address and after doing so they decide when they want to meet and once a week they meet at the center they talk about their problems and they find solutions often it takes a couple of it takes a couple of months so after six um, uh, sessions they reach a consensus and so parents having the same difficulties that we identified uh, already having the same um, difficulties so they gather and we have between five and ten parents not many and the parents def um, we share with them we show them the difficulties that they have and then they propose some themes that they want to address 
and they uh, prepare a calendar schedule. They meet once a week in the center and they talk about these problems. And the parents give themselves, give one another advice so that they can improve their behavior vis-a-vis -vis their children. And then uh, the last point is the uh, well-being assessment, which means that parents, they every parent what are non-economic assessments. So the parents are not going to uh, assess how many I don't know, clothes the children have, but rather, for instance, they evaluate respect, obedience, health, anger management, and we have a scale from 1 to 10, and they tell us, well, I think that I scored I don't know, in anger management, I scored level three, I scored, I scored three in January, which means I was too angry. Next month, he gets to five. And we see that little by little, the problem, the parents manage to control their, their anger and they start having better relationships with their children. So the well-being assessment also appreciates the integration level of children in their families. And this also has an impact on the parents themselves, because when the child is well integrated in the family, parents feel uh, at ease. So these are the eight techniques that we use most often. Um, if you have any question, please feel free to ask them. Thank you, Marie. Thank you, Jacques, for the quality of your presentation. I have a few questions. The first being. Okay, d'accord. <laughs> okay, merci beaucoup. Oh, thank you. Can you expand on the link between a positive and responsible parenting? This isn't the second, the result of the first. This, so the bond between positive and responsible parenting is this, isn't the second a result of the first. The second question, you talked about difficulties between parents and children. So you talked about the fact that children, uh, foster children are not given the same consideration as natural children of those families. So what is the relationship? What are the dynamics in these families? And the third question, with regards to the technique, the PD of the PADER techniques, how are parents chosen? How are they chosen to be part of these workshops? And how are the themes chosen? Are the parents that choose these themes? And the last question. I, uh, I have not really seen the involvement of children in your techniques. I mean, uh, as we're talking about, children psychology shouldn't children be involved more in these um, workshops thank you well, the bond between positive parenting and responsible parenting a positive parent a parent that is not brutal vis-a-vis -vis his or children a parent that understands his or her role, tries to improve his or her relationship with their children, of course, is a responsible parent, so, which means that what you said, I mean, the consequence of positive, positive parenting is responsible parenting. So uh, that's what it is. And then there's a second question, the lack of consideration of foster children in foster families. Well, 
when a child is not considered, well, a child is fostered. So at the beginning, he's accepted, he's chosen. Well, you come to our family, we're, we're going to care for you, we're going to grow together, blah, blah, blah. But once the child gets there, the child is treated as a slave. He's no longer treated as a parent. And parenting is not simply filial parenting because parenting a parent is anyone who wants to care for would like to answer the previous questions may I Musa, is that all right with you or, or or is did he answer your question uh we move to the next question how parents and themes are chosen right the themes how are they chosen well parents are chosen depending on their children so is the children who go to these resilience uh, workshops but for parents to uh, actually uh, 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 be involved we organize specific workshops so that sees the presence of both parents and children uh, and the blason de la famille c'est par exemple la main des aides La ligne no. du temps, ce sont des actions bien choisies et qui ont we été choose themes, specific themes that were already developed in the modules of the resilience workshops. So we work with the children and we do everything that we can so that parents can become resilient. And we want when children become resilient, they go back to their families but these families have to be prepared and become and they have must become resilient so these workshops have help parents uh, uh improve the, the children's upbringing with regards to positive parenting well we choose parents also depending on the children but we take some children that have common problems so we uh, you know, start with children with common problems, and we invite the parents. In doing so, we organize positive parenting workshops, and I will explain in the second part what we do in, in you know, in detail. Thank you, Jean-Jacques. Rose has a question, and then we're going to take a short break. Rose. Over to you. Thank you. I do not know whether you can hear me. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. I have a feeling. How can we accompany parents to really understand their children's psychology, most especially for the foster families? How can we help? parents uh, uh, accept their children back into their families. Thank you for your question. So how can we help parents understand their children's psychology? Well, here in our meetings with the parents, uh, well, there are some themes that we address. So be before addressing specific themes, we address general themes. For instance, uh, the life of children between five and 10 years. So an operator, a psychologist, develops the themes, and then parents will ask questions. There will be some recommendations. So during these parents' meetings, we address this type of themes, and the parents ask questions so that they can understand how to better. Uh, probably we did not get the end of the Final question, Rose asked a question, and also Emma had a second question, so we can remain first on this, uh, you know, first part. Um, did you see the question in the chat box, um, Emma's question from Kinshasa? Now, uh, Rose's question was, how can we help, how do you help parents accept their children? Mm. So how can we help parents accept their children? 
en mettant en application, en mettant en bon. application le, les principes ou les, les ateliers de parentalité positive. During en, positive parenting workshops, we will involve parents and parents will little by little accept their children. We have already observed this. Dans le quartier spécial de la prison, à un certain moment, les parents ne veulent pas aller les voir. Parents, at times when their children are in prison, they don't want to see their children anymore. But when we talk to the parents, when we invite them to go and visit their children, and when they take part in the positive parenting workshops, then the parents start to talk to the children in a more positive way. So they manage to um, to to actually accept their children little by little. So positive parenting workshops help parents to be positive parents, help parents to cooperate more their children, and the children are helped to better understand their parents, not to reject them. Also use them. Donc, other techniques that I've already mentioned. So all of these techniques go hand in hand. I mean, we do not simply uh, limit ourselves to positive parenting workshops, but also family visits uh, that take part in uh, resilience uh, workshops. Uh, we evaluate the well-being. So it all depends on the problems that children and parents have. So all of that helps parents accept their children and care for them. I do not know whether Rose, um, this answers your question. Well, yes, thank you, Jean-Jean. Thank you. Then, Aimee's question, Aimee from Kinshasa, um, how concretely does the parent evaluate him or herself? The starting indicators would be parents' problems, so lack of dialogue with the children, and then the parent must say whether he or she has evolved positively. Uh, if so, this requires honesty on the part of parents. Uh, do you think that parents really value themselves objectively? Le premier element. Now, the first element is that parents, first of all, need to define uh, the criteria of that evaluation, which means parents define the well-being. What are the basis, the elements of well-being. And if they self-evaluate in a negative way, in the wrong way, the parents will understand that they have to go back from uh, square one. They're back on square one. And so they need to be sincere with themselves. So we ask parents to really be objective and be sincere with themselves. And this assessment, this evaluation, is confidential. So the parents can also do this evaluation without even talking about this with our workers. And they parents can simply say, well, I have a good relationship with my children. They can say, well, my relationship with my children, positive. Because, uh, I mean, the parents understand that if they do not, uh, if they are not sincere and objective, they will not do uh, any justice to themselves. Thank you. I think that you can go on with the second part, and then we'll take questions for the second part on the second part. All right, thank you. Then, how do we implement positive parenting at PEDER? So, you can, you can see the principles uh, leading positive parenting. These are the same principles um, that we can find in the um, Declaration of the Right of the Child. First of all, we aim for the child, child's best interest. When we have positive parenting workshops, so well, we do everything for the child's best interest. It is the parent that has to try and change. Le premier principe, First principle is to aim for the child's best interest. That is the first principle. It is not the parent's best interest that we want to achieve during positive parenting workshops, but rather the child's best interest. The second principle 
The child has to participate in problem solving, in solving his own problem and also in building his or her future. That is uh, why children need to participate. So the parents are not going to find solutions to the problems, but rather it is the child that needs to find solutions for the problems. And the parents will simply support the children so that uh, the child can solve his or her problems. The third principle, Jean Jean, could you, could you go? Uh, can you come closer to the computer because we cannot hear you? All right. So the first principle is to aim to the for um, to the child's best interest. Can you follow me now? No. Yes, we were on the third principle. So the second principle: the child participates in the resolution of his or her problem and the construction of his her future. The parents cannot provide ready-made solutions to the child problems, but rather the child must participate, must work, must be active in order to solve his or her problems. The third point, to um, listen to the child. And the child has to speak up and the parent has to take the time to listen to the child. Now, normally, parents always give advice to the children, but in the long term, children may reject those uh, those uh, uh, advice, that advice, but now the child has to propose solutions and the parents ask questions to the children so that children can find better solutions for their problems. Fourth principle, give the children the most suitable ways to feel empowered and responsible. These are ways that physical, psychological, intellectual, but also moral in nature. So the parents must give children the opportunity to develop intellectually, physically, morally, so that they can become balanced people, so that they can be able to solve their problems. These are the four principles leading positive at the basis of positive parenting workshops. So what happens during a positive parenting workshop? Well, a positive parenting workshop is divided into three phases, the preparatory phase, the practical phase, but then the monitoring phase. In the preparatory phase, can you follow? Preparatory phase, a few weeks before the actual workshop, our team identifies the children having the same educational problems having the same upbringing problems, for instance, um, uh, theft, arrogance, um, drug use, uh, com family complex. So you, we start from the child, do you understand that? So do you understand that we, child that we start from the children to slowly get to the parents? So these are upbringing problems that uh, 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 in children that lead us to interact with the parents. So during the same, during the two weeks before the uh, workshop, we uh, hold family visits. We invite parents so that they can take part in the positive parenting workshop. The week before the workshop, we visit. We remind the parents of the workshop, we send a reminder, and the day before, we phone the parents so that the next day they can take part in the positive parenting workshop. So this is the preparatory phase. Now, the practical phase, the practical phase. In the phase practical, 
On invite les parents. Les parents s'assurent. In the practical phase, we invite parents to sit next to the children. Donc, ils ne seront pas séparés. So they are not going to be separated from their children, but rather every parent sits next to his or her children. If the image could show us. Uh, uh, right. So every child sits next to his or her parent. Now, so this physical closeness also entails a psychological closeness. We often, uh, we only have 15 parents in per workshop. So in every workshop, we have maximum 30 people. So 15 parents and 15 children. When they are there, the moderator presents the session, the theme, if, for instance, we're going to address the theme of theft or any other theme, so the theme of the day, the goal of the workshop and the methodology, as well as um, rules. So we insist on tolerance, uh, on discretion, on frankness, on confidence, on conviviality, and on confidence. These are the basic elements. Tolerance, discretion. What we say during a workshop will not be repeated outside of the workshop. Everyone has to be open, has to be frank and sincere to say what they feel. And then confidence, conviviality. After providing these elements, we start talking about the theme in general terms. So if the theme is theft, we talk about theft in general terms. We do not say, oh, you stole or you stole, no. And we give the floor to both parents and children. So 50% 50, 50 and 50%. And um, so we talk about theft, we talked about the theme in general. And after that, after this general dialogue, we have a positive interaction. The next image um, represents this positive interaction. So we have positive interaction. Now, during this active positive interaction, children and parents, every parent with his or her child goes to a corner and the, the child speaks most. And, and we ask, and the child explains why he did such or such a thing. And the parent is there not to give advice, but simply to listen, okay? So here we have a sister and the mother, and the child explains her problem to the mother, why she did a certain, a certain thing. After doing that, the two parties uh, make an engagement. They engage and they develop a life project. So the child promises something to his or her parent, and the parent promises something to the child to help the child improve his behavior. And in doing so, in the end, we get to the... To the, to, to the discussion, to the plenary meeting, and there is a declaration. Of course, if the children want to share their, and the, the participants want to share their engagement in public, they can do that, they can declare and say that. And then we have a meal. You see this young man, he's talking to his father, and the father, he simply listens very attentively so that he can understand what his child feels so that he can help his child improve his behavior. 
And in the end, they are going to take mutual engagements with one another and to stop, finish this phase, they take a meal or we take a meal all together. And this is, uh, and we do that because many children do not eat with their parents. Because we want children not to see their parents as enemies, but rather as people that can share their problems with. In the end, at the third part, we have the monitoring phase. In this phase, uh, we actually see what happens with the engagements. And the, the operator, the, the, our team, tells the parents to answer the uh, questionnaire on well-being. You see, the child in the middle, he was uh, really in conflict with his whole family, but now he feels united with his family. He feels well integrated in the family, and he, his uh, uh, family, his relationship with the family has improved. Now, the what we have achieved so far, the results that we have achieved. Uh, now, positive parenting workshops started in uh, uh, the um, in 2016 in a juvenile uh, court in juvenile prisons 274 children participated in our workshops 155 children now have good relationships with the parents following our workshops they are very integrated in their families and they really feel well it is 119 they have not yet fully and totally integrated however they have taken a few steps so they are no longer in an open conflict with their families because the children go to their families they visit their families and they start to integrate and we hope that over time they will totally integrate with the families and we hope that the family life will go back to normal and to conclude, I would like to share with you a couple of um, uh, stories. The, the story of a success and the story of a failure. Um, we had a child uh, that we, whom we called Trésor, he's 14. Now, this child is an orphan. His parents died because of, uh, of um, AIDS. His father was a, a serviceman, and the mother was not a native of the place. The child, after the parents died, was accused of sorcery, of witchcraft. And he uh, started by a neighbor, and he started to live in, uh, in the room, in the street. And this child uh, was sent to a foster family. Living in this family, the child was discriminated against. He didn't eat with the others. And uh, there was anything that happened in the family, well, he was guilty of that. He was guilty of anything. He was blamed for anything. But he did not want to leave this family because he had already lived in the street and he did not want to go back there. So he started to come to the center. And one day, he uh, spoke to one of our staff members and he said, I live in a family, but in this family, they mistreat me. We invited the parents, what well, group of parents with the same problem, intra-family violence. So we talked about violence, family violence. And uh, the foster parents, well, the father didn't come up, only the mother, his foster mother, came up. And Trésor, during the interactive phase, he presented his problem. He talked to his foster mother. That was a, a terrible moment because the mother felt 
that she was being attacked. But they went back to the family. The mother explained all the problems to the family members, and the whole family decided to integrate Trésor in the family uh, without mistreating him anymore. So the relationships improved, and Trésor felt at ease within the family. Trésor and his uh, foster mom, mother then presented the engagement to us, to the center, and to say Trésor feels very well, and he's very integrated in the family. This is really a very positive uh, 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 story that we have had with this child. And I hope that we hope that when he's uh, well, he, today he's 14 and we hope that in uh, around a couple of times a couple of years uh, time he will manage to go to learn a job and now a failure we have had a, do a girl madeleine her parents are separated the father did not marry again and the mother married again and had seven children with the new husband madeleine lived with her mother but at one point she had a fight with uh, the new husband and madeleine decided to go and live with, with her parent with her father but the father was very violent and Madeleine copied her father's behavior. She started to uh, smoke, and we felt that Madeleine's uh, behavior went from bad to worse. So we invited the parents to the center. They did not show up. At the fourth invitation, the, our team went to Madeleine's home, but when they got there, before even starting uh, to talk about why they were there, the father started to talk about his problems, his life was a problem, and in the end, he started to beat, to beat up Madeleine while the, our team was there. And on that same day, he, the father fled to Goma. We do not know. He's unaccounted for. We do not know what happened to him. But there are still many positive aspects because we really trust positive parenting workshops. Now, some challenges that we've encountered uh, uh, with the positive parenting workshops, well, the preparation of these workshops entails a lot of time, demands a lot of time and sacrifices. At times, uh, we have to travel long distances. Uh, also, because at times, uh, we have to actually invite people and we have to give, uh, physically give the um, uh, invitation to the parents. Uh, and that is why we have to try about well, long distances. Uh, some parents, uh, this is the second challenge, some parents do not show up at the workshops uh, despite the invitations and despite the reminders. But the parents, uh, simply they do not want to show up. So the absence of these parents uh, make it impossible for us to uh, uh, for, for our method to bear fruit, third difficulty, some children are not are not open to vis-a-vis -vis their parents, so they present their problems superficially, and they provide superficial solutions instead of uh, providing uh, well thought out uh, solutions. And then. Uh, the monitoring of the uh, engagements taken by the two parties uh, uh, takes a lot of time because we have to actually see whether these engagements, uh, uh, these commitments uh, have been complied with. Um, if the child says, uh, 
uh, I decided to go back home before 6 p.m. Well, we have to monitor that. We have to check whether he sticks to his word. And uh, if these uh, uh, commitments are not complied with, well, we have to start from scratch. So this is what I wanted to uh, talk to you about. Uh, we also, I also prepared a technical, um, the var various, for instance, uh, dossiers. Um, we have the technical, uh, uh, the technical dossier for uh, holding these uh, workshops, so also a technical uh, uh, um, file for a family mediation, a technical file for positive parenting and workshops, and then the well-being questionnaire. Now, this is simply to give you an idea, to give you uh, this to, to give you an idea of what we do. So this is what I managed to prepare for the second part of my presentation. If you have any question, please ask away, and I will try to respond. Thank you. Can you hear me? Sí, muy importante los planteamientos. Nosotros for what you shared. Well, ourselves, I'm from Colombia, and we are studying also of family violence. And one of the themes that we are seeing is that uh, what we're analyzing several types of, uh, of violence, and only physical, but also psychological, economic, and so on. And according to what I'm hearing, I think we should try and build tools to try and curtail and limit this type of, uh, of violence. For instance, in Spain, there is a law against the family violence. So, Spain, for instance, they are very advanced in this theme, and this is fundamental to favor uh, this collaboration between children and parents. And my question, do you also have any program to address this type of behaviors of children, this type of violence of children against their parents. Merci Angelica. Thank you, Angelica. So children who are aggressive vis-a-vis -vis their parents. Do you have cases of children aggressing, uh, being aggressive with their parents? But if children are aggressive to the parents, um, well, with positive parenting workshops, so we can also organize uh, workshops, specific workshops on this theme. So we talk, first of all, about aggressive uh, behavior in general. And after doing that, in general, parents, the most essential part I mean, the, the, the essential part of the in a parenting a positive parenting workshop is the second part, the part um, about positive relationships, so the active interaction between parents and children, and the children can talk to his parents and explain why he's aggressive. Maybe the parent. Uh, provokes the child, the child can express him or herself. And then we also do other activities with the, the child, for instance, through resilience workshops. Uh, there is, for instance, a timeline. And the child uh, can show the positive aspects that he has had in his life and what 
and also the negative ones uh, so which are the things that hurt the child more and then the psychologist comes in and the psychologist will work with the child so that the child can overcome his trauma at the same time so we, we integrate positive parenting with psychologists. Positive parenting is not a standalone thing. There are several things, several elements that contribute to positive parenting. We do several techniques. Thank you, Marie-Law. And thank you, Jean-Jean, for the wonderful presentation and for all the practical experiences. Well, actually, a question was asked by Aimé. I really like the question and the comment that she uh, offered is very pertinent. It's, it's very difficult to, to self-evaluate, especially in some contexts, in the parenting context. I also work with in this um, framework, but there are always the key uh, uh, criteria, what we call progress markers, progress indicators, and they, uh, are, they are basic criteria that help us understand how far we have gone, if we have advanced. So there is always a basic uh, evaluation. So what should, what are the key indicators of a good, of an ideal uh, uh, parenting? Parents are already prepared to say that, to say, I am a parent, I am a responsible parent. But what are the key indicators of a responsible parent, for instance? Uh, and also, uh, these uh, uh, criteria help us understand what parents changed in their behavior. And on the basis of that, uh, uh, I mean, we have to uh, really have uh, some, uh, some, some changes that are visible. The proof of change, what are the parents doing differently, for instance? So this shows that the self-evaluation can really be objective because it has to reflect the objective changes. But, for instance, a good self-evaluation also entails the comments, the evaluation of people who live with or work with that person. For instance, uh, we can ask, how was this person in the past? Uh, and they can say, well, this person changed. Uh, and in what ways? So this is, of course, a self-evaluation, but the person should also tell us uh, who can substantiate those changes. This makes us understand whether these progress indicators have actually been uh, uh, satisfied and met by the person. Thank you, Benin, for the, uh, adding this. I think that we are all working really um, in the same sense. I'm happy to, to see that. We move on to the third part. We only have 10 minutes. All right, 10 minutes. The mediation familial. The family mediation process. So here, the family mediation process is a process that is very time consuming. It can take six months, it can take a whole year. The starting element is that the child should accept family mediation. So the child must be, uh, uh, must want to engage in this. So uh, uh, what is important is the child's participation and that is the basis for family mediation. 
So we have four stages. First of all, we need to define with a child a family reunion. So the child must define that. What does he mean by family reunion? Some believe that living in the street is normal and um, it's not a problem for them. They would rather live in the street than in a family. And so we accompany children, these children in special ways. The second element, the child must find short-term, medium-term and long-term advantages in family reunion, reunifications from the emotional, social, health, and, and security-wise standpoints. So when we find an agreement on that, we can find we can move to the second phase, the uh, breakup of family bonds. Now, the first part can take one or two weeks, depends on the child. It depends also on the time spent in the street. It also depends on the level of conflict that the child had with the family. So the breakup of family links, that's the second element. The child must find the deepest causes that let him or her to break up with the family. It's not our staff that starts to invent, oh, did you leave your family because for this or that reason? No, it's up to the child to find the reasons. And after finding all these causes, uh, we find the relevance of each cause. So we analyze uh, the relevance of each cause. Some uh, 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 some of the things uh, identified by the children, well, the, the parents do not even know of that. For instance, uh, my parents do not love me. What's the evidence of that? When we start analyzing that, the child says, uh, well, for such and such reason, and we say, no, we try and explain. And so we find that the major cause that led the child to break up for, from his or her family. Then, after doing that, we move on to the third element. The uh, We look for family reconciliation. The child will need to mention all the family members, grandparents, uh, grandparents, uh, direct parents, uh, brothers, cousins, uh, and so on, who could give all of these uh, elements. And uh, what helps us to do that is also the family uh, sort of code of, our, I mean, we have a workshop, a resilience workshop that helps us find all the family members in a child's family and also the relationship that the child has with all of these uh, uh, family members. So the child has to uh, find, discover the relationships, the family dynamics. For instance, uh, for instance, uh, if the uncles uh, had a fight with one another, we ask the child, what are the uh, family members your parents are in a good relationship with? And we invite the child to get in touch with these family members. And so, and then cordial relationships that exist between the child and these family members. And so this is the third element, the relationships existing between the child and the other members of the family. The child has to find ways to solve the family breakup, the reason why broke away from his family. So if the fam if the child has good relationships with family members, then this can help child understand why he broke away from the family, but also how to solve that problem. And when a child manages to solve, to, to find ways to solve the problem, well, we can help him basically, uh, you know, overcome the problem. Often the children are very superficial. For instance, I wanted to have money, 
All right, but you earn money in, in the street. Uh, and ca wh uh, why can't you earn money living in your family? The child has to find ways to solve uh, the major cause for his uh, breakup. That we analyze with the ch child uh, the ways that he's found uh, so that we can get to a solution. And then we ask the child to find three family members uh, with whom this reconciliation will have to be successful. So we ask the child to give us three family members, not just one, because if the, there's not a good reconciliation with the first or the second family member, we still have the chance to have a third family member she can reconcile with. And then uh, the child has to uh, uh, establish, let's say, a deadline for the family reunification. So you want to get in touch with your family members within one month, within uh, a day, within uh, a week, and so on. And we support the child in doing that. Then we have to also look for the those family members that are most likely to succeed in the family reunification. So we and we talk. We talk with the child of the child situation. I mean, we talk with the uh, family members about the child situation. At the beginning, I said that we would rather have indirect mediation when we've already found a compromise with the family members. The child can also visit the family after the compromise has been found. So, for instance, the compromise is that the child uh, can spend a weekend in his family, uh, and that is the compromise. And little by little, we increase the time spent within the family. And uh, the uh, child will be first accompanied by our staff, and then he will remain within the family alone. So the staff will be a sort of, our staff will act as a sort of mediator, but at first, but then we will leave the child, the family members, talk about their problems, we will uh, uh, speak with one another without filters. And we also ask the parents to give more time to the children to express themselves. We ask the, ch the parents not to tell the children off because the, the children will feel guilty and they will they will uh, escape one, uh, again. So if possible, we can also review the deadlines for the family reunification. And when we, so that we can fully understand what the children will be able to uh, go back to the family. And the fourth element is the fam fa family reunification as such, decided with uh, the family as a whole. So this means that the child is brought back to the family and we have the um, family reunification certificate signed. And after that, we will make it reunify the family. So these are the various stages that we follow in the family mediation process. So we start with the child first. We analyze with the child what family reunion is, uh, the causes for the break breakup. The child uh, identifies some fam family members uh, for unification, and then we have the family reun reunification. We do not limit ourselves only to the family members, but we also consider the whole community in which the child lives. We also, for instance, get to in touch with neighbors, religious leaders, other family members. The photo that we see, the girl in the middle is the one who was reunited with the other family members. So here you have the mother, with the our staff, then we have uh, also the priest of the church on the right. So this intervention concluded with a uh, family reunification. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Jean.
well done for your intervention, despite all the difficulties that we've had. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jean. Jean, I really appreciated your presentation. The question that I have is uh, the child. I mean, we have to, you have to go to the family, but also you have to ask the child whether he wants to be reunited with his family, the her family. But for instance, um, uh, here we're told that, that the child has to be in our centers between three and six months. I mean, by the time the child comes to us, we collect all the information, or well, maybe three or four months pass by. We have the time to engage in this process. Um, um, thank you. So we will basically have the time to follow the whole procedure. Well, the law uh, says something about this. Yes, of course, we should not have to hurry things. Uh, if you cannot get to a total integration of the child in or her family, well, you have to achieve that progressively, little by little. And this also depends on the level of conflict that the child has had with his or her family. But here, even here, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, the uh, deadline is three months, uh, and this can be renewed up to two years, uh, sorry, up to two times. Uh, at times, the children, they're not interested at all. So what we will do, will we throw them into the streets? No, we will support the children, and we try and do we try to renew this authorization. We try and talk to the judge, to the juvenile judge, in order to explain that we have to, to delay this procedure. So the, le the law says something, but the social reality says quite another thing. So, of course, uh, the law at times imposes, well, the reality at times imposes on us uh, things which are contrary to the law. At times, uh, uh, we are told that we have institution institutionalized children, but with these children, we have to advance slowly. This is what I can tell you. Thank you. I really, really appreciated your presentation. All right, so we're going to conclude. Thank you once again, Jean Jean, for your presentation. I working with parents means, first of all, working with children. We have to work on how the children feel about the parents. And there are several uh, tools, uh, complementary tools uh, that you use. And I also urge all the various technical um, files that were shared by Jean Jean that will lead you to adopt and to discover his um, uh, process. Thank you very much for the sharing. I wish to thank you. I really thank you for your attention. Thank you for giving us this opportunity to share this experience. Maybe in the future, will we also be able to uh, listen to other people's uh, experiences. And I hope that I will be able to uh, share our experience even more in the future. All right, so see you next week and enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Yeah.